in just about every function carried out in the body. This video is not really the place for a long list of vitamins and what they do, but it is important to have a good overview of what they're about. Vitamins are organic substances that occur naturally in very small amounts in food. Some foods are better sources of vitamins than others. Generally, they're not made by our bodies. An exception to this, as we shall see, is vitamin D. The best way to get vitamins is from food and drinks. If you eat a well-balanced diet with plenty of variety, you won't need vitamin pills. We know of 13 vitamins and each plays a vital role in the cells and tissues of the body. Too little of a vitamin and we end up with a vitamin deficiency disease, which can be very unpleasant. Energy release, vision, bone growth, blood clotting, cell respiration, making red blood cells, brain, nerve and muscle function, and the maintenance of the body's connective tissues are just a few of the most important functions involving vitamins. Some vitamins are fat soluble, whilst others, mainly the B vitamins and vitamin C, are water soluble. Fat soluble vitamins accumulate in our body's fat stores and in the liver. Because they're stored in the body, if you consume too many, they can become quite toxic. Water soluble vitamins are usually absorbed very quickly and therefore need to be part of our daily diet. Excess water soluble vitamins are disposed of in urine or in faeces. Also, the water soluble vitamins are more easily destroyed by cooking. As we said earlier, with the exception of vitamin D, vitamins are not made by our bodies. Most of our vitamin D is made in our skin when it comes in contact with sunlight. When it's made this way, it's more easily used by our body than when it's obtained from food. Only about 4% of our body weight is made up of minerals. But like all other nutrients, they perform many vital functions in our bodies. You'll find them in your teeth, bones, muscles and soft tissues, as well as in your blood and nerve cells. Some of their main roles are to help regulate nerve and muscle activity, help maintain the body's water balance and to assist with the absorption of nutrients. There are 16 minerals that are considered essential for human life. We'll look at two of which are of considerable concern in the Western diets calcium and iron. Iron in the form of haemoglobin in the blood carries oxygen from the lungs to the tissues so that energy can be used. Too little iron and you'll get what's called nutritional anemia which means you'll get very tired. Meat preferably of the lean variety, provides the best source, but it's also plentiful in a range of other animal and plant foods, such as spinach and silver beet. However, plant foods contain substances that hinder the absorption of iron. Therefore, iron in plant foods is not as easily absorbed as iron from red meat. However, only 15 to 20% of the iron we eat is absorbed into the bloodstream and the rest passes out of the body. As well, some of the iron that does get absorbed is lost whenever we lose blood through, say, injury, menstruation, or when we donate blood. Iron's a problem in both rich and poor countries. In Western countries, about 4% of boys and 10% of girls consume less than half the recommended daily intake for iron, and that places them at risk of getting anemia. This is mainly because of a poor diet with not enough iron-rich foods. It's understandable in poor countries, but quite unnecessary in rich countries. In fact, iron deficiency is the world's most common nutrient deficiency.
Of all the minerals in the body, calcium seems to be the one that attracts the most concern. There just isn't enough of it in many people's diets. Calcium makes up about 1.5 to 2% of our body weight, nearly all of it in the bones. What's left over is used for the functioning of nerves and muscles, blood clotting and helping some enzymes and hormones to perform effectively. Good sources of calcium are milk and dairy products, some fish and seafood, and plant foods such as soya bean curd, almonds and spinach. If you don't get enough of it, you risk getting osteoporosis, which causes the bones to become fragile and to fracture and break. Often it's a greater problem for women. When a woman goes through menopause, she loses a great deal of calcium, and if she hasn't absorbed enough during infancy, childhood, adolescence, and while breastfeeding, she can have all sorts of problems with fractures and breaks. However, men also suffer from osteoporosis. As with iron, some sources of calcium are better than others. Calcium from plant foods is not as easily absorbed because plants contain substances that make absorption of calcium into the bloodstream more difficult. If you decide to increase your calcium intake, it's a good idea to use low fat products because if you're not careful, too much saturated fat could become just as big a problem for you as a lack of calcium. A recent study showed that about a quarter of kids between the ages of 10 and 15 consume less than half the recommended daily intake of calcium. Now that's pretty serious, and it's particularly serious for young girls. Water. Just turn on the tap and there it is. Something we usually take for granted. Nutritionally, water is in a category all of its own and it's in everything we eat and drink and it becomes part of our bodies. If we were to do a chemical breakdown of our bodies, we would find that they're made up of the six nutrients, the main one being water. Adult females are made up of 51% water and adult males are 60% water. A newborn baby's body is made up of a whopping 70 to 75% water, and the human brain is also about 75% water. As you would expect, water content is not spread evenly throughout the body. Blood is made up of 90% water, bones 20%, and muscle is 70% water. Even body fat contains up to 30% water. Water plays a vital role in the body. It helps regulate temperature, carries nutrients and oxygen through the body, removes waste, and helps cushion joints and organs. And that's not all. While we could survive for weeks without food, we could only survive a few days without water. That's mainly because our bodies lose water all the time through breathing and perspiration and by eliminating waste. So how much water do we need? Well, for our bodies to work properly, we need to drink between one and two litres of water every day. That's the equivalent of six to eight glasses. Of course, we don't have to drink that much actual water, as we get some of it in fruit and other foods but most of us do need to drink more water than we do now. So make sure you get enough. Now before we go on to part two of this program, let's look at energy intake a little more closely. Basically, almost all our energy comes from carbohydrates, fats and proteins. Each gram of carbohydrate you eat provides 16 kilojoules of energy and every gram of fat yields more than twice as much energy as carbohydrate. 
Protein is only used when other energy is no longer available. So how much energy do we actually need? Well, that depends on a number of things. Different people have different energy needs. For example, adolescents and pregnant women need more energy than older people. So do people who exercise and play sport regularly. Even sleeping or just resting requires some energy. Four kilojoules of energy are needed every minute when the body is at rest. Studying uses up to around eight kilojoules of energy. Preparing food uses about 12 kilojoules and walking briskly uses 16 kilojoules. When you start to perspire, you're using about 20 kilojoules per minute. And heavy lifting and very stressful sports use up to over 40 kilojoules. So a heavy bout of aerobics, for example, can use up to five times more energy than just sitting at your desk. However, the important thing to remember is that no matter whether you play a lot of sport or just hang around a lot, you need to balance your food intake with your energy expenditure. If you use up the energy you consume, your body weight will remain stable. If you use more energy than you consume, you'll lose weight. And as you probably guessed, if you take in more energy than you use, you'll gain weight. So it's important to not only eat the right balance of carbohydrates, protein and fat, but if you want to maintain a healthy body weight, make sure you're active enough to use the energy you've consumed. Okay, so that's a brief rundown of the six nutrients we need to stay alive. In part two of the program, we're going to look at recommendations for daily intakes of nutrients. So how do we know we're eating the right quantity of each nutrient? Well probably many of us don't know much about it at all, or at least not enough. Recent surveys show that in the United States, 55% of the adult population is overweight, and an additional 23% are obese. Unfortunately, the United States is not alone. Around 37% of Australian adults are overweight and a further 18% are obese. And in the United Kingdom, studies show around 40% of the adult population is overweight, and an additional 17% are obese. In the past, nutrition guides were essentially about providing information to prevent deficiencies. But as we can gather from the recent obesity figures, in many countries, deficiencies have given way to overconsumption. So what can we do about it? Well, healthy eating plans are a good place to start. For example, health organisations throughout the world have produced up-to-date nutrition guides and food models designed to help us make informed decisions about the food we consume and to help us develop healthy eating patterns. And often guides are developed to meet the specific needs of population groups or health conditions. So if we follow dietary guidelines like these, there shouldn't be any problems. There are times, however, when we require specific information about nutrients, such as during pregnancy, when dealing with a particular illness, or wider problems, such as girls not getting enough calcium and iron in their diets. It's then that we can turn to the recommended dietary intake, or RDIs. The National Health and Medical Research Council has formulated recommended dietary intakes for all vitamins and minerals for 12 or so different population groups, including infants as well as pregnant and lactating women. For example, when we look at vitamin B2 or riboflavin, 
we noticed that newborn infants, boys and girls, require 0.4 of a milligram each day. As they grow into young children, the recommended daily intake for vitamin B2 steadily increases. From the age of 8 years onwards, boys need slightly more vitamin B2 than girls of the same age. Unlike boys, the recommended daily intake actually decreases slightly for girls in the 16 to 18 year age group. In adulthood, men and women require slightly less vitamin B2 than they did in their late teenage years. However, pregnant women need more and lactating women need about half of what they did when they were pregnant. In their senior years, men and women require a little less vitamin B2 than they did during the rest of their adult life. Not all people are the same, and most of us need different amounts of nutrients to carry out the same functions in our body. For example, my body may not absorb calcium as well as yours so I might need to consume more of it than you do. So when the National Health and Medical Research Council sets an RDI for calcium, say, it takes into account people like me, who have a greater need than the average. So RDIs are set at about 33% higher than what is needed by most healthy people. This means that although 800 milligrams of calcium per day is recommended for 16 to 18 year old girls, 540 milligrams should be enough for most of them. But when studies show that large groups of people have nutrient intakes far, far below the RDI, it's time for health and education authorities to take action. This has happened with both calcium and iron in recent years. Girls particularly can become deficient in these minerals if they don't pay attention to their dietary needs or wrongly believe red meat and dairy products are to be avoided. So remember, what you eat is up to you. But it's a good idea 